Hello, Tony Perella. Good to see you. It's good to see you, Paul. Thanks for having me back. I really appreciate it. Well, it uh, it's it's great to be able to get time with you. I you are one of the busiest men in motorsport. You've got a lot of things happening at once, and uh, you don't lack ambition, my friend. And <laughs> no, I haven't been accused of that. No, so, you know we're we're a couple months after celebrating our tenth anniversary, and and that gave me a chance to we had we had bought SVRA in September of 2012. So it I gave me a chance to reflect of how much has changed in, in 10 years and how much of what my original plan was for this company to what actually came true and where we are today. And, and it's in many respects, we're way farther than I thought we would be. In many respects, I feel like we haven't even gotten started yet, which I, I don't know in my lifetime at a 10 year, I'm, first of all, I never had a 10 year anniversary with a single company. This is, it took, took me a while to get to that benchmark. But this, um, this, this opportunity, it just continues to evolve. And, and there's been many things that contributed to that. But, you know, to frame up, and if you want data points, if you think about SBRA in 2011 ran at three racetracks. Three. We will, you know, the goal was to write a nas build a national footprint, attract uh, the best of the best for vintage racing, take that, commoditize it with sponsorship that it would be beneficial to them, and then invest back into the business to become part of mainstream motorsports as a gate. That's what the, you know, 30 second pitch of my business plan. And, you know, I think we've done all of that as far as building the footprint national, you know, next year, 23, I think we are planning on as a company, minimum of 23 events, maybe as many as 25. We're working on the final details on some. That's all. <laughs> so, you know, when you, when you look at just that, just that data point, that's yeah. significant, but there's so many, so many pieces that people probably don't realize that go on behind the curtain. You know, we added along the journey, the opportunity to become involved with Trans Am. That was as much passion on my part as a kid. That was my first race I attended with my dad. And, and Same here. And, I love Trans Am. You know, and so to be a small part of that initially as an investor and, and have them on some of the races to, you know, now owning Trans Am, and the national footprint that we've built out there and the re reemergence of Trans Am. I mean, uh, we just celebrated our season ending race at Coda and the series has been here since 1966 and we had an 81 car field, the largest in our history. Uh, most of that's fueled by TA2, but even the TA class and production classes have gone through a cycle this year of growth and I'm, I'm pretty excited. So that's a big deal. Uh, you know, COVID, like all challenges in business, scared the hell out of me in plain English three years ago, going into COVID, going on in the event business. And I got all these employees and are we going to be able to have events and are we safe? And I came out of COVID twice the size that we were <laughs> when we went in because I doubled down again. You know, we, yeah. we heard the rest of Trans Am. We invested in Formula Four and Formula Regional Americas. We done a 25-year agreement with SCCA Pro. We, we've really, um, really went all in. Even without the benefit of a gate, most of those events, the company kept on its trajectory. We, we managed to keep the lion's share of our partners through that by doing a lot of extra things. And here we sit coming out of 23, far and away, the biggest year our company's ever had in our tenure history. So I'm, I'm relieved. I'm grateful. But yet, when I look at us and I'm objective about it, we have we have addressed many of the things that I hope to do as a business to build the footprint of sponsors, the back office systems that creates a great opportunity for our sponsors, the streaming, all these other things. What I don't think we've done a good enough job is is telling our story when a customer comes in and buys a ticket, I'm not sure they know what's going on all the time. Even if yep. you're a race fan, 
I don't think we do enough on behalf of our spectators. In that, I am kind of, you know, every year I pick one or two things that I'm going to personally put my arms around and try to impact in a positive way. And, and I can tell you, catering, we have spent 10 years building a footprint to cater to racers. And it was great plan, good plan, exactly what I wanted to do. Now it's time for me to put as much emphasis on our paying spectators to take our business to the next scale. And that's going to that's gonna completely change our way of doing business. Um, everything from when you walk through the door, you should have an event map to how we engage leveraging our streaming while you're at the track. Um, all, all different kinds of things. It's not just sizzle. It's some of it's just basic blocking and tackling, but I've spent the last year kind of trying to bring people in as secret shoppers to give me their their view of us. And it's it's been eye-opening. And you know, sometimes you get locked in that groove. Yeah. I don't I don't think we've done the right thing on that side. And and we will. I I can tell you that's well, my, my self-awareness is the first uh, you know, racers have have always got to get to the truth of their performance. Uh so you're also a racer, which uh you know, uh, uh, is apparent in, in what you're describing here. You want to know how you're doing. You know, you you always are a person that looks at metrics. You you run your business on a dashboard. You know, uh, which I want to talk about a little bit here in a, in a minute. But when you look at the opportunity for this business that you've scaled massively since you took it over, there was a dormant opportunity there that few saw. You know, truthfully, uh, what was the single driver? What drove it? this growth what, what i was think the thing that i okay. mean i think for me the motivation to do it I, I had spent 30 years in telecommunication and was fortunate enough to take two companies public and then after that about a company out of bankruptcy and sold it to aero electronics a fortune 150 company so i had this tremendous career in telecommunications but i have to say i never was passionate about the product we sold yeah. about the people who i worked with in I swore when I got done with my last company, I was going to find something that I truly cared about. And I'd always been a racer, but looking at it through the eyes of a business, I had no experience in that. And when I, I went vintage racing and actually got to go race at Watkins in 2011, I think it was, and said, holy cow, this could be pretty cool. Yeah. And I'd get to go play race car driver. Um, as I run the business. Well, the one thing I did learn, that's not happening. I grew the business so fast, so fast that I really, I had to make a choice. I couldn't really be a racer and, 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 a, and a, you know, really a promoter and take care of the customer. So my racing has fallen by the wayside. They did actually race a Coda uh, this past, uh, this past, uh, weekend at, at Coda that we ran and I uh, got back into 58 after five years and I realized that I need to stick to my day job. I'm not the driver. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard to go in and out. It was fun. And, and my grandson and daughter things. were there, but it's, it's, it's time to hang up the helmet for me, I think. Yeah, but the mindset is always with you and all that matters is now and what you do next and learn from what happened. I, I've seen that in you since I met you, you know, and it's impressive and inspiring to look at what you've done uh, with the business. And, uh, um, you know, I, I'm a fan of uh, the, the overall business you have. I think that you've made a real a mark on the industry. Um, I, I think you stabilized uh, one of my true loves in the in the world is Trans Am. Uh, I just thought as, as a race fan, I want to thank you for that because it's a beautiful thing. Um, and looking at what you've done with the diversification of the business, uh, it was unthinkable 10 years ago that this would be a multifaceted uh, race organizing company with uh, vintage racing. Trans Am in the multiple categories, uh, Formula uh, Regional Americas and Formula Four, which is part of the FIA ladder to Formula One, and the other series that you're able to bring uh, to run a companion to your events. Uh, 
Did, was that in your vision uh, or was it, uh, was it something that evolved just by learning the business? I think more evolution than, than that I actually saw it going in. And yeah. I did see a lot when I said I was going to build a national footprint. We were going to be the first to crack the code to race at Indianapolis. We are going to be first to have a vintage race, the code, all, all these, you know, the national championship. And frankly, the vintage community, when I came in with guns a blazing, we're going to do all these things. Uh, I ruffled a few feathers, I'll put it that way. Yeah, the enthusiasm was was muted. Yeah, it, you know, who's this, guy, who's this idiot? And, 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 and honestly, some of it was, I really believe what I was selling. Some of it I was naive of how hard it yeah. would. But what I learned very quickly, vintage racing for the most part at the club level was built on the backs of racers, either through entry fees right. and in licensing, really no revenue and sponsorship, no revenue in gate. There's exceptions to that, but if you, if you looked at the quote industry, if you want to call it that, nobody had cracked the code on a national scale, certainly, but even in a regional scale of multi events that had big gates and, and sponsors. And there were single events, obviously, the Monterey Storks, the MIDI. The Hawk, or you know, uh, those there's a select few events, Lime Rock, clearly, but nobody had done it on a national scale. And so I came in thinking, I'm going to do that. And yeah. I, I, I got it out. But what it, the issue was, you build it and they will come is a really expensive way to figure out if you know what you're doing or not. You got up front to run all the track, some races yeah. well received, some weren't. And so I had the opportunity with John Claggett to have Trans Am as an undercard, and it really was more thinking, well, hell, this will this will protect my downside if nobody shows up to Sebring yeah. here, and, and we'll cover our expenses. But when I did have Trans Am come in, it was like, this is really cool, and if we put the two together, serious amount, we could really build something here because Trans Am, if you looked at that by itself. Uh, without OEM support, and Trans Am had none when I got involved and still really doesn't, it, we had to do it differently than it had been done before. When I got involved right. with them, everybody says, you got to go get Chevy, you got to go get Ford, you got to go get Dodge. I, I agree with you, but what do I bring to the table that they're going to want to come in? And I went to Detroit, and that's basically what they asked me. So. I very quickly said, okay, if we put the two together, you're leveraging the Trans Am brand, scale, certainty, sponsorship, following, years of in business. But we bring to them certainty on a schedule, scale, national, some sponsorship, our back office systems. And by putting the two together, we built a we built a business model that is completely different than anybody in the space that I know of because everyone else in the space that is pro series typically is relying on an OEM or more than one OEM. Right. Connect the dots. And I wish I had that problem, but I, I don't. So I had to figure out another way to pay the bills. And, and, you know, now regional formula in, in, in F4 and SCCA pro to us to sanction the method is really simple that when I add events now, I'll be sanctioning other series that are an undercard or pay the bill, much like I learned with Trans Am. Yeah. I don't necessarily have to own them, but I can have an anchor tenant and expand almost as much as I want and make sure that there's certainty that we won't lose money. And that, as crude as that sounds, that's the model that we've built. And then it's figuring out all the other elements of marketing, promotion, et cetera, to take it to another level. Well, it's basic entrepreneurial logic. And, and uh, you know, you're, 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 you're leveraging the, the, the ambient environment, the properties uh, that are there that, that need a home. They need a nest to build their businesses on, too. And you're providing a stable uh, platform for that. And, you know, I, I, you've touched on something here that I, I was really impressed with, uh, you know, during uh, been exposed to a couple of your uh, conferences that you hold, uh, year-end conferences for your uh, partners. And, you know, uh, sure. our company has been a partner over the years, and we, we're very grateful for that. And, and you're 
your uh, dashboard and your understanding of the value of the audience data um, and the focus on that customer and knowing what you need to know about them and what they want. And that also serves you in dealing with your partners. You know, what compelled you to go in there and get that done at the level you did? You're well ahead of the rest of the industry, by the way. I, I, th I, I thank you for saying that. I, I think it really had to do with my past life experience as a CEO in telecommunications. I'd get the, the marketing team running into my office saying, we got this great opportunity. Can we spend the money? And my, my typical reaction was, of course you can. Show me the ROI. Yeah. And then there would be this glazed over look in the marketing guy's face saying, well, I, I, I don't know how we can measure that, but the branding is great. And typically, branding doesn't do a, a lot for me as a CEO. So we don't sell branding, even though we provide some pretty significant branding metrics. Most of our sponsorship has been built on B2B. Um, probably the biggest uh, no name that we did. I built a great relationship over the years and we were very successful was with Jaguar and Land Rover with Kim McCullough. And you you opened that door for me to get to her. And she we she was new in that role and I was new in the space. And we put our heads together saying, you know, what's the metrics of how many, how many arriving drives do you have to do to sell a Jaguar? And yeah. over the years we collectively sold between Jaguar and Land Rover 400 vehicles that we could match back to our events that were signed. When you do the map on that, and now that same principle of our tying our systems to our, our promotion with our magazine and other elements, streaming, our digital placement in, in, in the world, but also our on-site placement to all this huge database. We got 26,000 racers just in the SVRA database that have accumulated and come and gone over the last 10 years. Well, that demographic is invaluable. When I came into the space, I could have gone with a pre-built registration system that 99% of the people were using at the time, and it's a great product. But I chose not to do that. I went against the grain because I wanted to own the data, but I also wanted to build a sponsor connection with my systems. And if I had outsourced the systems, there's no way I could do that. So I went, I spent a lot of time and effort and money to build this over. And it's still in the progress. It's still every year we bolt on some cool new pieces. But the foundation of that has been in place for 10 years since we've been operating. And, and it's really been, you know, if to put it in, if you want a metrics of numbers, over half our revenue today, even though we've gone from three events to 20 plus, over half our revenue comes from sponsorship revenue and gate revenue and car show revenue instead of the backs of the racers yet we're, I don't know, 30. That's, that's to the benefit of everyone, Tony. And, yeah. and it, it, you know, and looking at this trajectory of, of what you created with that, that, I think that's a window into your, the, the soul of a, an entrepreneur. And, you know, you saw an opportunity beyond the actual on-track product and the, the white noise that we deal with when we go to a racetrack, all of us are in this business. You know, it's a maelstrom of things coming at you, problems to solve and so forth. But the greater problem always has been is the relationship with the customer and the community of not just racers and fans, but the community of people trying to reach them. And, uh, you know, I, I have a saying that, you know, it, it's racing's always been about learning faster and better than your competition to get to the future faster. So uh, it looks like you beat Liberty Media by about five or six years because this is exactly what they're doing with Formula One. Um, well, I hope I hope someday I could be as big as Liberty Media. Well, you know, uh, they, uh, I, 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 I won't bet against you, uh, but the uh, uh, the reality is that this is the you know this is the new model. Uh, I think the whole sport's going to go to, and you've already got the product in place. You've already got a business that's operating against this model. You know, your focus on uh, the fan experience is, is one I've heard you speak about before that you're really, you know, you had, you had some blocking and tackling to do, but that's obviously an area where I know you'll be successful. You'll do, do what you normally do, which is uh, bringing the right uh, people, tools, and, and, and the right 
analysis to get to where you need to be because you're not you're doing it for the actual customer and you're going to know what they want exactly the, yeah the, um, when we sell sponsorship i'm involved with i would guess 90 percent of the sponsor proposals we do and i will not let my team put out a proposal without having a, a uh, actual process that we go through with a potential customer or a sponsor to really do a deep dive into their marketing needs and, and objectives and goals. And we tie it all the way back. And then we do a customized proposal. When I came in and I worked with industry salespeople who had been in the space for a while and had a decent Rolodex, their process typically was 15 seconds after they're in of what they can do on a price. And I'm going, well, what are we doing here? And so yeah, yeah, yeah. we, we, we find that we've invested heavily in, in our support of our sponsors. We're, we're actually looking at another concept of, you know, we've, we've invested in two tractor trailers to run the business. And now I'm thinking I need a third one on behalf of our sponsors, because right. what I'm finding is a lot of the smaller automotive sponsors that we have it's not what they spend with me it's the fact that they can't spend with me and justify going to 20 something events to sit there and hope somebody comes up to the booth so i'm actually toying with the idea of building a sponsor activation trailer and process that you can have a you would you like us to activate for you and so whether you're selling fuel cells or you're selling seats or batteries or whatever your thing is Makes total sense. If we go to all the events, let me do it for you. And, and at a price point that's so economical in today's market with travel costs, that's that's one of the things we plan to do. You mentioned travel costs. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, you know, I, I think that uh, you're one of the people I think of in managing a complex business like this is, you know, it's a you know, most of these racing series are relatively small revenue businesses. So everything matters. Literally everything matters. You know, your advice to the rest of us that are dealing with material cost increases through inflation, soaring travel prices, just the cost increases we've seen in traveling team and staff mm -hmm. uh, this past two years has been, you know, astronomical. How do you deal with it? And what is your advice to our colleagues in this business? Well, I, I think the number one thing you have to do is be able to see your business to manage your business. And if I, if you know, in my travels across the world as a CEO in telecom or when I was a consulting in between roles, there was a common theme of businesses that were struggling. They couldn't see their business. And if you can't see it, you can't manage it. It's that simple. We, Great advice. Our, our, our cost for travel this year, I can, I'll tell you, right, I'll, I'll show you my warts. We were up, we spent an additional 400,000 yeah. hotel, airfare, rent a car, and um, mileage to drive to event in that case through our race in uh, at VIR, which is in October. We still had Coda and Utah to go. And we had spent, 400,000 more, which not shocking when you consider gas prices a year ago versus gas prices throughout yeah. the year and, and all this COVID impact and no inventory for rental cars, all, all the drama that everybody deals with right now in business. Um, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been involved with quite a few operations calls to say, uh, is there a smarter way to do yes. this? Uh, should we have remote timing for the point side, but we have only a team of three to do all the series? Uh, can we, how do we, you know, so it's constant evolution. What I don't want to do is just, as just raise my rates. The last thing I want to do is just increase entry fees or ticket prices, because all I'm doing is contributing to inflation. If I do that, what I've challenged my team and myself is okay. There's two ways to solve this. We manage the business even more efficiently and better without giving up safety in any way. And B, we get after it on the sales side for more sponsors that should be leveraging us. Like, why don't I have a hotel sponsor? Right. We had over 9,000 room nights 
in, in the last six months. Why are, why am, why do I not have an official hotel of SRA or Trans Am or whatever? So this is a, we're still very much a work in progress, but what I don't want to do is just justify a price increase because my costs went up. I think that's irresponsible on my point because that will ultimately bite you if you do it. It might make you feel a little better on your margin squeeze for short term. Figure out a better way to do it is what I would recommend. Well, that's what racers are here to do. They're here to learn and uh, racing is learning. And I've seen you learn rapidly since you uh, appeared in this space. And uh, it, it's a uh, it's an honor to have you as a friend, Tony, and I admire what you and and your team have accomplished. Um, uh, you're relentless, and uh, I uh, I uh, I'd hate to have you in my rearview mirror on the racetrack, uh, if the racetrack of business. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm in your rearview mirror. You can relax. <laughs> you're the race well, you're going to find a way through, and days. that's uh, that's what racers do. So, thank you for taking the time to be with us here today. It's been really I, fun I, talking with you today. I really appreciate you guys having me on, and uh, good luck with this year's seminar. It's it's incredible. The cast of characters you're interviewing and uh, the scale and depth of this this program is phenomenal. So congrats on that as well. <laughs> I, I can catch as many of these segments as possible. I, I got through the replay part, a lot of them late, you know, this year from last year, just because it wasn't possible for me to dedicate the time when it was live, but holy cow, I, I, I took advantage of it. So thank you for that. Th thank you very much, Tony. Wishing you the absolute best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tony. Registering on ePARTRADE is easy. To start, click on the Join for Free button on the homepage. First, search your company to see if it's already in our database. If you see your company on the list, click on it to select it. Then, choose Claim Company if you are one of the decision makers, an owner, marketing person, or main company contact. Or choose Join Company if you are an employee, and press Continue. If you couldn't find your company in our database, select Register a New Company. On the following page, fill out your name, email, phone number, job title, and choose a secure password. If you chose Register a New Company, you'll need to choose your business type. Select Supplier if you're looking to display products or services and connect with buyers. Choose Racing Business if you're looking to source new parts and connect with suppliers. Choose Race Team if you own or are a member of a professional race team. Then, enter your company name. Please provide a website, Facebook page, or LinkedIn if you have one, and choose to either claim or join the company. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Finally, click Register Now and your registration will be submitted for approval. An email will be sent to your inbox. Please confirm your email address and you will be approved shortly. Welcome to ePartrade.